Hey guys, Trevor here. I just wanted to jump in at the beginning of this episode real quick and let you know that we have launched a Patreon yesterday. There's plenty of more details in the video that we released yesterday. And if you'd like to support us on Patreon, we have that up and running. So without further ado, here's your episode and we've got a Patreon. Welcome back to Following Know It On, a Stolen Light podcast. This week is episode 69, and we are doing chapters 49 through 52 of Oathbringer. Paul, how are you? Outstanding. Can't wait. Doing good. Elliot? 50 chapters into this uh, this book already. I feel like that went by in the, the blink of an eye. Um, actually, we're 52 chapters into this book now, so... Oh, okay, okay. Uh-huh. 52 <laughs> chapters, blink uh-huh. of an eye. We have Dalinar content and more Dalinar content and more Dalinar content to talk about in this episode. Last week, we didn't have any of our main characters. This week, we've got full, like three full Dalinar chapters to talk about, so... If you were, you don't sound very excited about that, Trevor. Oh no, I'm certainly excited. I'm just saying, if you guys were bored from last episode, then maybe you will be excited for this one. Paul, did I ask you for your two words? You have not. Oh, what are your two words? Wouldn't you like to know, weather boy? No, um, my two words are mystery and adventure. <laughs> All right, I got sass and sass from Paul. Elliot, what are your two words? <laughs> My first word is words, and my second word <laughs> is hyphenated, so it counts as one. It's self-actualization. Wow. That's one word. That's definitely yes. one word. Okay. Let's use these four words and talk about it. Bring her. All right, I just want to jump right to it because I'm really curious. What is self-actualization to tell us here in in these episodes? I'm so glad you asked. So I'm going to get a little literary and philosophical. I don't know quite what this is on you guys, but bear with me. These chapters, especially the flashback flashback chapters with Dalinar, has me really trying to figure out why are struggling so hard. And it... It hit me in these chapters. He, I think he's really just can't find this is um, down on the, in the past, the flashback downer. He just can't find his purpose. He can't find his, like, who am I? He thinks it's battle and the thrill, and he can't stop seeking after that because everywhere else he goes, he feels empty. And I think what that is is a lack of self-fulfillment or self-actualization. There's a thing called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. Google it if you uh, are curious. There's lots of good articles all about it. But basically the way the theory goes is we as humans have a, a hierarchy of needs. And they start with the basic ones like food. We need food. We need water. We need sleep, You know, safety, those kinds of things. Once you have those, then your body starts to crave kind of the next hierarchy. And that's relationships and friendships. And then above that comes uh accomplishment or prestige and then the very top tier the very highest need is self-actualization and that's the fulfillment of your purpose basically the the feeling that you're doing what you're meant to do and and not a lot of people get to that point like that's kind of the the ultimate struggle of humanity and i feel like that's where downer is at right now he's accomplished a lot he has a loving family he has security he doesn't have self-actualization that was a lot of words to explain that, but hopefully that wasn't too confusing. I was with you the whole time. You and your second one? My other word is words. And I know that's confusing too. I'm just being really confusing this episode because I because I can. I I picked words for something that Gavilar says in chapter 49. He hints, or him and Dalinar are talking about words and like our our words we say powerful and Dalinar is like I think Dalinar's kind of saying yeah words aren't really enough and then Galar responds with this he says I can't help 
feeling words would be enough if only I knew the right ones to say, which harkens all the way back to the prologue where Gavilar says, somebody help me with the exact words, find the, the words, oh, no, I'm blanking on it. Brother, find the most important words a man can say. Right there, right there. And so this is Gavilar before that, right? So does somewhere in the middle of this Gavilar find those words? What are those words? Are they the ideals of the Knights Radiant? Is it something different? That's what I'm wondering about in these chapters. Or when he dies, has he still not found it? And that's why he's trying to push it onto Dalinar to continue what he's working on? Right. Yep. Could be. Paul, what are your two words? And <laughs> what do they mean? Well, first off, well, I want to say I'm very impressed with your two words this week, Elliot. It's my, my little funny quip, because I'm extremely funny, you know, is that we're really giving Trevor a hard time with these words, because one of your words was words, yes. and then the other was hyphenated, and and <laughs> I was just being sassy, and so I was like, this week we're really giving Trevor a hard time with our words. But my two words are mystery and adventure, and they don't really go together at all. Mystery is for mostly chapter 50, um, when Delinar is looking for Talonel, and just kind of the, the mystery kind of unfolding there, or what, what the heck is going on, don't really know. Um, my second word, adventure, I think is a little bit funny. It's talking about Elokar's expedition and, and things like that. Just the mention of it, I just get the, like, I'm going on an adventure, like... From the Hobbit. That's just the picture that comes to my mind, even though I don't think that is a very accurate depiction. Mm -hmm. um, that That's where my mind goes. So, Good stuff. I like all four of those words. You would. I would. You're sass and sass from Paul tonight. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Chapter 49. We have the birth of Adolin Colin. And the title of this chapter is titled Born Unto Light. And that is the meaning behind Adolin's name. And so what were you guys' impressions on this chapter? And we get a decent amount of Dalinar content before Adolin is is in the picture. So what we can start there and what what were your thoughts on Dalinar at the beginning of this chapter versus at the end of the chapter? So the, the note I wrote down about Dalinar in this chapter was Dalinar with the thrill is bad. We, we've seen what he can do on the battlefield and just the destruction he brings when he's full of the thrill. Dalinar without the thrill is almost worse. Here we see Dalinar just in a pub without the thrill like just down in the dumps, I I'm immediately brought back to like Teft that we just saw. That there's a comparison because Dalinar has the some fire moss here in this same uh, same scene, but it, it's not quite to the maybe depravity of where Teft was at or the should I say the fallenness or addiction level that Teft is at. But he's just empty. He's searching for what do I do, and he the only like bit of fulfillment he can get is beating people up to the point where he's wrecking other people just absolutely destroying them and doesn't even realize it like he he's just such a i don't know he's such a a tempest such a storm and he doesn't even know it he's just yeah i don't know not a good place all right with these chapters in mind and everything you know about dalinar is he still your favorite character, Elliot? <laughs> so, fair question. I I think I've talked about this before. I'm getting I'm getting nervous about my liking of Dalinar, right? Because this is not the character that I like. This is so many things that I don't like. Like this is the this is abuse of power. This is just wastefulness. This is you know the opposite of being an honorable wind runner where you're watching out for people around you. This is Dalinar can't figure out his life and he's destroying everyone else around him. It's just not good. But 
if he is able to get through this and get to the point where we see him in present day, if that, that's a journey that's him overcoming this, then it's awesome. But there's a lot of other ways that this can play out, which is why I'm nervous, because I don't know where the missing pieces are, what they're going to be. And Dalinar doesn't know either, right? You know, his memory is just as patchy as our understanding of this. So where is this going? I, I'm nervous. There's one of those missing pieces. You know what the missing piece is. You just don't know where it goes and why it goes is the Night Watcher. Is he's, he's coming at such a low... All right, let me back up. The last two books we've been introduced to Dalinar as, you know, this perfect leader guy. He's he's honorable, he does what's right all the time. Like he's a pretty good father to his two sons. He's 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 a pretty good guy. And then at this point in Oathbringer, we've pulled him down fairly low to a point where he's not a super likable guy in his youth. And so how does he get back to where we met him now? And what are those missing pieces is really going to define Dalinar as a character. So, can I, can I sidebar us real quick? I know I'm doing a lot of talking and not giving Paul a chance here, but do we have time for yeah. a little bunny trail? Yeah. Oh, yes. I would love this. Okay. So I had a realization while I was reading these, uh, these chapters. And remind me if I'm wrong, because I was running on very little sleep these last few weeks. So we may have talked about this already, but I don't think we did. There was a big moment where, is it Kadash? Is that the name of Dalinar's uh, lieutenant guy? We did talk about this, but continue. And I wanted to so talk we, about this again. So we talked about this a little bit, but we did not hit on something that hit me as I was reading these chapters. I was like, wait, wait a second. Yep. So here's the wait a second. Kadash has told Dalinar. Present so day Kadash Dalinar. Is, Correct. So present day, Kadash is an ardent, right? And he's got a problem with Dalinar because Dalinar is marrying Navani, which is not okay. Kadash says to him, Dalinar, I can't trust you after what I saw in the rift. We jumped to the conclusion very quickly because I think it's shortly after that. Maybe it's before where we... It's the immediate chapter after. Okay. So right, right after that, we see the chapter where Dalinar wins Oathbringer, his sword. And it's left open ended at the end of that chapter, right? Where the son of the, uh, the high prince that Dalinar is killing to take the sword is, you know, the six year old holding a, the shard blade trying to defend his father. It's left open ended. We jump to the conclusion that Dalinar kills that child to take Oathbringer. Kadash is there in that scene. So Kadash walks out of that room. We jumped to the conclusion that that was the moment. That was the moment that Kadash is referring to of, I saw what you did to that child, therefore I can't trust you. Now flip forward a couple chapters later, we got a big revelation of, oh, wait a second, Dalinar didn't kill that child. There's a moment where Gavilar and Dal- Dalinar have a little heart heart about that. He's like, you did kill that, uh, that offspring, right? Dalinar says, uh, no. And we talk about we talked about that how big of a moment what that is. What we I don't think we did talk about is, well, hold on a second. If Kadash didn't see a murdered child, what is he referring to? Is there going to be another incident in that same location that shatters Kadash's trust of Dalinar? Like, I had a I had a just pause and, and think about it moment of now I'm confused again, what is going to happen and have we not hit it yet? And it's really good that you're bringing this up now because that's part of this, this chapter 49 is Gavilar is there for the birth of Adolin and congratulates Dalinar and everything that's appropriate there, but then pulls him aside. Like Dalinar can clearly see that, Oh, his mind is elsewhere. What well, something's happening. Gavilar pulls him aside. And what does he tell him? Well, he sends him off to war, right? Right, but he tells him that the rift is in full rebellion. Right, yes. And he, Gavilar doesn't specifically want to go s- squash that yet. He's going to send Dalinar somewhere else to prove to the rift that they mean business and they will go 
settle that rebellion if they need to, but they don't want to yet. So they're going to go somewhere else that's more serious right now and prove to them that they will step in if they need to, but he hasn't sent him back to the rift yet yet right what if they what if this ploy doesn't work he goes off and fights off the invaders shows that you know gavilar and dalinar have the military might necessary to squash the rift what if that doesn't bring the rift into line what if dalinar eventually gets back to gavilar and they still have to deal with this rebellion and what if it doesn't get dealt with in a great way i I don't know We, we know there's something huge in dalinar's past that's not good. And I thought we'd hit it. And I just realized as I was reading his chapters that what I should have realized six, eight chapters ago, we didn't hit what we think we hit. It's still ahead of us. Are we all really good point? Are we all still on track here? I'm, I'm tracking, (laughs) but (laughs) yes, I'm on track. It kind of just the, we thought there was a sigh of relief. Right. Like, Oh, Dalinar didn't kill that kid or do something really bad but you were can you've noticed and you brought it up to me so i guess i could say now i've noticed that there's probably something else bad and we're gonna have to kind of be on the watch or see where the story goes as far as his flashback in his past Uh, because we still haven't ever touched on the night watcher or anything like that right like there's a lot of development still to happen definitely and i'm assuming that's gonna happen now, this is Delinar's book, and we're learning about his past um, in these scenarios. So, we we are getting there though, because I told you at the beginning of this book that there are, and when we started meeting Evie, that there are two main events that need to happen before we can before Evie dies, and they are Adolin and Renarin, right? Right. And by the end of this episode. Both Adolin and Renarin are born, so as bad as it sounds, Evie's now free to die whenever. So, <laughs> and am I remembering incorrectly <laughs> that like Adolin has a vague memory of his mother, but Renarin doesn't really? Didn't Adolin and Renarin have a conversation, or am I imagining this? I think you might be imagining that. I think they both okay. have vague memories of of their mother. Okay. Okay. Fair. But we've we've hit some requirements, so well, it could okay. happen. Soon. No. Actually, the answer to that question is Renarin has vague memories of his mother. Adolin specifically doesn't talk about his mother. Okay. Okay. Mm. Well, let's get started. Yeah. <laughs> is it as hopefully enough of a bunny trail there? We can probably talk about what's actually in these chapters. <laughs> now that we're 15 minutes into the episode. Yeah. <laughs> No, we no, we, I, I we really did like what you said. We did start this because Dalinar, mm-hmm. before the, before or without the thrill, he's, uh, a bully. I, we'll just say put it that way. He let likes fire moss, hangs out in pubs, beating up other guys because he can. You know, like mm-hmm. why not? So he just. Yeah, he he was always talking about someone. He wants someone to fight him as if he weren't a high prince, so they wouldn't hold back or like all this stuff and whatnot and and things. Yeah, you you were. I was being funny. We we've kind of gotten started there, and uh, we talked about how Adolin is born, and I feel like we've always had this seeing the flashbacks. It's a weird dynamic. I can't quite put my finger on of. Dalinar seems kind of heartless or cold towards Evie, but at times he's also like, oh, she is really stunning, and he like really appreciates her and, and things like that. And I feel like we kind of get that with this chapter. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm kind of curious to hear Elliot's thoughts on this. So this is, yeah, right when Adolin is born is in this chapter 49. Um, oh. And there's kind of a perspective change yeah so when when adolin is born here dalinar he does he seems to appreciate evi a little bit at least in this moment and he also gets really excited about his new baby son which i thought was really cool and super relatable for me because that happened to me a few weeks ago i i had a baby son that was that was born and he talks about the 
Dalinar talks about in this moment the how your perspective changes and how he, I think he even mentions like, oh, I, I understand why Gavilar thinks about the big picture now, why Gavilar cares about, you know, building something that's sustainable because he's got kids. And this is something that people had told me before I had kids that, oh, when you have kids, your world changes, you know, everything changes. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I did not understand it until the day I had kids. And it really hits you that every single thing you do in your life is different when you have kids. Every decision you make changes because you're now thinking about them in addition to yourself. And it's just cool how all of that was kind of in this moment for me. I'm sure a lot of other people don't read that into into this scene, but I certainly did because it's something very fresh on on my mind over the last few years. I also read very deeply into this. I can't relate at all, but <laughs> I think it's it's neat to hear about. Uh, You'll get. I'm there, sure Paul. one day I'll, I'll, I'll relate. One day, you know. Very cool, though. There's an offhand comment between Gavilar and Dalinar of Yasna in this in this chapter. At this point, Yasna would be somewhere around, I want to say, 8, 9, 10. And Yasna has some sort of something going on. They call it lunacy and how she's being treated for that. And... What 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 are your guys is like? Does this tie to last episodes? Something that's happening in Yasna's past that's like makes her ill. Is that is this related? Is this different? Is this Yasna just having crazy ideas at age ten and they're trying to be like, okay, be a nice foreign girl? And she's like, no, you know, whatever. But are are these related? Or are they not? I'm assuming that this is related right now, just with these information drops. Um, same with like our our Kremlin sightings. I, I'm almost putting this in the same category as that, of like, yeah, Brandon Sanderson. I feel like is just dropping these little pieces around um, that will be prevalent or relevant in the future. Um, and so I'm gonna connect those dots, but we just have a little line off here to the side. We don't have the picture, so. In my mind. We had not just had the Yasna perspective chapter that mentioned this. I totally would have written this off as, oh, little brilliant nine-year-old Yasna is like, you know, doing really smart things that everyone else just thinks is lunacy. But the fact that she in her chapter referenced it as illness makes me think that these are related and it is some sort of a medical condition or something it makes me think of like the shallan flashbacks that we've had and the you know rather strange upbringing that she had doesn't seem like it's at that level by any means of what shallan went through but just kind of the like oh we have a strange child that maybe we're you know hiding from the public because she has this condition sort of hinting maybe it kind of has Renarin vibes to me of he's, of yeah he's got epilepsy so we don't let him carry a sword but he's still he's still here but we we keep an eye on him type of thing but lunacy is certainly a bigger act like a bigger deal than epilepsy so anything else from 49 no not really. It was great. All right. Chapter 50. Dalinar is flying to the war camps. And he's kind of freaking out about it, but he gets his gets his stomach under control. And Kaladin lashes everybody in the front of a high storm, which is kind of cool. And they land in the war camps and queen and he gets a or actually navani gets a span read that says that queen fen wants to visit your theru there's some development there queen fen is the is from thalen city she's the queen of thalena 
um, they are a big shipping nation. And so that they've specifically been targeting her because of her strategic benefit to for their oath gate is they can get the get control of the southern part of Roshar with her shipping. So there's some development there. And yeah, I, they mentioned how she makes this decision after going into a vision, right? Yes. That seemed a little strange to me. It's because Dalinar has been the only one going into visions so far, right? Aside from the other people he's brought in with him. Right. So the fact that she's going in on her own seems different. Yeah, that is super weird that. She's like, yeah, I went to the vision of Ahari Etiam, and after that I figured out, you know, what's well, what to do, and I'll visit your Ethereum with you. So did she need this, like, is she talking to the Stormfather now? What's what's happening? <laughs> like, <laughs> That's a good question. That, that was my main question. Of, is like, is she somehow able to to connect to the Stormfather, or is th- I don't think this is a Bondsmith thing. As far as I know, this is a S- Stormfather specific thing. Um, or maybe so she will confused. bond some kind of spren that's similar to the Stormfather and become our second Bondsmith, maybe? Perhaps so. I do hope that this is a, an example of, like, she saw that vision and it inspired her to want to help save the world. I hope that's what this is. I I've learned not to trust people. So I, I wonder if this is her just, you know, saying, Ooh, there's some interesting things here. I need to be on the inside as opposed to the outside, but maybe we'll see when she actually gets there. All right. Dalinar and Kaladin visit the monastery that Talonel was being held in, and he is not there. His room is still locked, and he's been carved a window from the outside, and he's gone. What are you, what are your thoughts? Dun, dun, dun. So, so at least we don't have to be someone with a shard blade, right? Don't we know this? You guys know this information. Is it Amarium? <laughs> That's always yes. my like, thought. Okay. As the Everstorm was hitting, Amaram grabbed him and yeah, we talked about this like not too long ago either. Like Yatil yes. came to try to assassinate Talonel. Um that's where the blow dart comes from. And Amaram got it got him out and Amaram has him. Okay, I didn't remember the blow dart specifically, and I remembered it was like, okay, Amram is the one who is, like, looking for, interested in getting Talonel. It's just at the very end of what I didn't. Okay, I guess I didn't remember that he was still actively looking now. I was thinking of that as, like, the past thing. So I guess I wasn't thinking of that as current still, as, like, guaranteed. But yes, like I'm fully on board. That that's right. Yeah. I I too was not connecting those for some reason. But now that you say that, that makes perfect. We we basically saw that scene, right, where yes. the the dart got fired and yeah, all of that. I guess I was thinking in my head that during that time, Amram did not have a shard blade. But maybe I'm wrong. Hmm. Interesting. Because that's. Uh, I'd have to go back and reread it for the exact timing there because Dalinar basically confiscates the shard blade from Amaram. Amaram gets a shard blade from Eli later, right? Amaram's a shard bearer. He has one to start. He already had one? Okay. I think what you're thinking of is just when Dalinar, like, bonds the other one and like pulls it out or whatever but. so yeah so amaram has shallan's brother's blade kaladin you know kaladin right. won't touch it kaladin wins it that whole that whole shenanigan gotcha. um dalinar confiscates talonel's shard blade 
bonds it, gives it back to Talonel, tells Amram, hey, go talk to this madman guy and see if he has a shard blade. And he goes and talks to him. It's like, nope, he doesn't have a shard blade, but he, but Amram stashed it. And then Dalinar summons it because he's bonded it already. So he doesn't have, Amram doesn't have that shard blade, but he does have his own that, you know. Right. Which we knew. So I should have connected those, but for some reason didn't. And yeah, yeah. So, so we should have known all of this. It was a surprise to Dalinar, but we already knew this. Yeah, that's what the podcast is for. We, we got enough crazy theories going on that uh, that was one that slipped my mind. Yes, that's okay. So yes, Amaram has Talonel, as far as we know, and Dalinar is now fully missing Talonel, that they realize that they lost him in the evacuation of the war camps and nobody knows where he is. That was and about all I got out of. Him. Me too. I'm really curious where they're stashing him or when he's going to come back into the story here. Or what are they even like gaining from him? Like, he's probably just going to be like muttering stuff over and over, right? Like, does Amram have a, a specific plan or anything like. Oh, yeah, or is it... from what we've seen of Talonel, he's just going to be like, Desolation, come, collect, and uh, Yezrian, go get him, you know? And he'll just yeah. kind of loop through his little his little things he says, and then that's kind of it. I mean, it might just be as simple as a like a power play, right? I mean, Amram's thinking, ooh, this guy's important. I'll hang on to him. He'll be important later, you know? That's, that's almost what I'm thinking. It seems like Amram knows way more than he's letting on so i bet it's more than that i bet amram knows exactly what he has but it could honestly just be as simple as i know dalinar needs this guy i'm gonna stash him until i can use him we talked not too long ago about the sons of honor and how amram is tied to that right and he was actually fairly involved because he was with gavilar back when gavilar was the the head of the sons of honor so he could be leading them for all we know right now Where do you so do you guys you guys know where Amram is right now, right? Eurethiru. Correct. He is leading House Sadius in Eurethiru. Do you think Talonel is in Eurethiru? Or is he somewhere else? Probably somewhere else. I think so too. Either at the uh, back at the war camps, perhaps hidden away. I mean the the ghost bloods showed us that there's secret places in the the war camps that you can hide things in, so he could easily be stashed away there. Anything else from fifty? Not here. All what right, a mystery. Chapter fifty one. We get a split per point of view chapter with two characters that I never thought would share a chapter. Uh, Moash and Shalon are <laughs> share a chapter here, and we get some interesting perspective for both of them. Start with Moash because he comes first. He's approaching Kolinar pretty close with the with the sled and slave labor and all that fun stuff. What'd you guys get out of this Moash uh, segment? Some interesting stuff about the Voidbringers, but which I want to talk about with you guys. I want to see what you guys think about it. But before that, I actually just picked up on some pretty simple, like world building elements that I thought were pretty cool here that I wanted to mention. Moash notices these like storm wards, I think he calls them. And he describes how they've built up these, you know, artificial protections from the storm over many generations by like building a wooden barrier, letting it crust over with creme, then building another wooden barrier on top of that, letting it crust over with creme and then, you know, so on and so forth over, you know, a couple hundred years to eventually build up this massive windbreak that allows them to build an orchard or a town, you know, on the backside of that windbreak, which I thought was really cool. Like that totally 
makes sense. This whole like high storm driven economy and world and how everything revolves around that. This this was just another moment, another reminder of that that you sometimes forget of just how everything seems to be built around the fact that you get a hurricane level high storm every week here in this world. <laughs> and the the second reminder of that I thought was even cooler. He talks about Kolinar, the city, and how there's a like a big open plain around Kolinar for like a day's walk. And at first thought, it's like, oh, okay, open plain in front of the city. Sure, fine. And then he talks about how that's a defense mechanism. And it's actually brilliant. And I would never even thought of this, but the fact that Sanderson works this in here, this is this is perfect. Having that open plain is a defense mechanism. It's like a moat because you can't camp your army out there. Because if you do, the high storm is going to come in and wipe you out. Right. And so that forces an attacking force to camp a full day's march away from your city in order to attack you, which means that you're going to see them coming. You're, you've got a little bit of a barrier, a little bit of a buffer there between an army who's besieging your city, which is brilliant. And again, all built around the fact that a high storm comes every 10 days or seven days or whatever it is. I totally agree, Elliot, the, the world building and then taking that okay this is my world now i'm going to build a strategy like think yeah. as as a general would and then use that in my world building of all right i'm going to create this 20 mile expanse around my my city and that's my moat because there's a huge hurricane every six 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 seven days or whatever so yeah i totally agree that's really cool the there's little key moments in some chapters i don't know if you guys remember uh, way back in the Way of Kings, when Dalinar has a vision of the recreants of Feverstone Keep and how it explains how the icicles are sideways. There's like it's yeah. w it's winter, and so they get like snow hurricanes in, as high storms, and all the all the icicles are sideways because they've been you know blown by high storm. Like I just think little details like that are so cool. Of just really cool visual there in your head so the the part i wanted your guys's i really wanted your guys's thoughts on though are the parchmen slash parshendi slash void bringers slash fused because honestly trevor and or paul i need some help i'm getting i'm actually getting a little lost here what are the differences? And, and Moash kind of talks about this. Moash is like watching the fused and he notices that there's different types of them and they look different to the regular parchment. He talks even about like war form and work form. He's starting to, you know, use it, some of that lingo. I thought that the void bringers, which in this book are getting called the fused, were just the storm form that we saw the Parshendi achieve in words of radiance but is that not the case where are the lines between parchment parshendi and fused all right this is a very good question and there's a reason why this hasn't really been completely spelled out here is because you are learning this right along with the alethi right along with our heroes of wait these are beings from like the way far past oh wait they're the parchmen that are sitting right next to us but are they really because then there's a difference between the fused and the parshendi you know like th there's so here's i will go ahead and fully answer your question here elliot and we this might be the first time i've ever done this but you now know enough where i can spell something out for you okay the parshendi or the singers as they call themselves, or the listeners, as they call themselves, are like are a species, are a race, and as that race, they can take different forms, and no spren is required for taking different forms. So they somehow they had their forms taken away from them and only were given dull form, and that's what a parchment is. Um, and that's for 4,500 years since the last desolation. They had their form stolen from them and they were given 
dull form. So pause right there just to confirm. So Parshman, the, the, what used to be the slaves of the Alethi, is no different than a Parshendian dull form. Correct? Correct. It, it yes. is a Parshendian dull form. Yeah. Correct. Got it. That it, there Got is it. no difference there. And Got the it. so the difference between a Parshendi that we found that we were fighting in the Way of Kings and a Parshman who were serving us in the Way of Kings is just the form they were in. Okay. They didn't know that at the time, but that's right. That as we know now, that's the definition. Now, once they are given different forms, then their their brain kind of unlocks. Their their brain is locked in dull form, as they've kind of they've kind of said where they've they're fully coherent. They just don't know how to think for themselves, and they they can watch what's happening around them, but they don't do anything about it. And that's what Saw is really upset about in this first uh, part of this book is K Kaladin. You have no right to tell me. I, you know how I feel because you're a dark eyes. They literally sold my wife and I didn't do anything about it. How, how that makes me so angry that I want to make sure my daughter like has a better life than that. Like that you can't relate to that at all is, is what he accuses Kaladin of. Now Parshendi equals is the same level as like human. They just have different forms. That's the race that they are now. If they bond a spren, they can then ascend to their equivalent of the Knight's Radiant, which is the Fused. Of uh, If you bond a spren, that unlocks using this other type of power that Moash is observing, where some of them are flying, some of them are not, etc., etc. So a Fused is a Parshendi that has... Uh, grabbed a spren and bonded it. However, there's a distinct difference in that the spren takes over the body of the the Parshendi as opposed to bonds like a, a cohesive bond Alongside, with the... Yeah. Right. And so that explains the whole like reincarnation thing, right? Correct. Where... So you can kill so... the host, but you cannot kill the spren. And the spren okay. just finds another Parshendi to bond with and takes over their their body. Got it. Okay. Okay. That I yeah, I feel like that was all bits of information that I I knew, but putting all that in, in one right sentence really was helpful. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So uh Elliot, remember last week we were talking about Relaine. What oh, if yeah. Relaine is our loyal Bridge Four member? And then in the middle of an intense battle or like, I don't know, something like that, a sprint takes control of them Ooh. and then they've got a man on the inside that causes some severe damage. That's, that's, that's my little, I don't that's know if it's a prediction, but that's, that's my thought will, going forward. I will even take this one step further for you guys. What does Rock call Sil? God. A little god. Uh -huh. What does Gavilar tell Eshenai that he's going to do at the beginning of this book? Waken or free their old gods. Return their yeah. old gods. And mm -hmm. that is why the Parshendi ordered the death of Gavilar because what he's saying is, I'm going to return your trapped spren from damnation to so you guys can become the fused again because they call their spren gods that's who we're talking about when right. does that right. make sense yes it does make a lot of sense actually my only question is are they the same as our other spren are they just different types of spren or is this a different like how we have the honor spren and the cryptics and Cultivation spren or whatever is this a different type of spren or is this just a totally different, like Parshendi specific spren? All right, uh, now just for the, our listeners who are watching on YouTube specifically, if you have are listening to this episode and you've listened to Words of Radiance, there's a specific difference 
that I did not explain to them. Do not correct me in the comments because it's a spoiler. So the, what I told you is not 100% correct. It's 99% correct. And there's a specific difference that we could talk about if we've read with the mm -hmm. Rhythm of War, but we're not going to talk about it yet. Okay. Go to our Discord where we have spoiler channels and you can talk all about that kind in of the, stuff. In correct. the Rhythm of War channel. There we go. Yeah. Or even... Mm, yeah. There we go. I appreciate the info you've given us, Trevor. That was very... You're welcome. Very clarifying, and yes. normally we don't actually get an answer out of you. We just get it. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We're finally yeah. getting to the content where I can actually explain things without it being super spoilery, because all, yeah. you, <laughs> all you really needed... You had all the letters. You just needed the word in front of you to understand what was happening. So I spelled it all out for you there. And it's, it's honestly I mean, so helpful. Like I love these books and how dense and how much stuff is going on and how big this is, but even I'm getting lost. Like I'm reading this so slowly and studying it, but there's even like parts of this where I'm reading is like, well, I, I know that I'm supposed to understand this, but I don't. So to have like you guys to bounce ideas off of and talk this through is I can't, I can't imagine reading this book anyway, any other way. Like this is, this is so cool to be able to do it this way. I love it. So back into this chapter, so all of that, that we're starting to understand, and Moash is maybe starting to put a little bit of that together, he notices that there's different types of fused. And like Trevor, you were just explaining to us, it does seem like these are almost the equivalent of like different orders of Knights Radiant. They seem to have different powers. They seem to have, yeah, different types of spren or different spren that they've bond and are able to do different things paul do you think this is going to be like a one-to-one -one, like knights radiant they have their exact equivalents in the parshendi world or is it going to be different okay i'm really glad you brought this up and if you didn't i was about to anyways so i have oh man this is just a night of rabbit holes this isn't a complete like rabbit trail but i have some thoughts one so we know that there are these unmade right what if these unmade, we don't know fully, and there's probably something that could disprove this. I'm not going too hard on this theory, but what if our unmade are just these like inverse heralds that are in this Parshendi Sprint world, right? With whatever these Parshendi Knights Radiant classes are. Um, like if, if there is a difference, which I could see there being a difference, I could also see them being the same. Or maybe like a twisted dark version, like we've said, the like dark stormlight, which I want to come back to. I, ha I have something I've been thinking about that. Um, but let's let's say there's this like dark stormlight and these like dark spren that take control of the um, the parshendi and that make them the fuse to now. Also, do we? I'm assuming Trevor wouldn't be able to share this, but do we know, is there any level of willingness of, like, the sprint taking over? Because we saw with Esh and I, right? She kind of went out and was kind of, like, asking to become Stormform, as far as I know, and wasn't whenever the whole, um, what was it called? The Our reverse high storm came through, and some people were made into Stormform, and some weren't. And, I, and it seemed like it was a willing, like, you get to choose if you want to become a Stormform Parshendi. Um, but if you do, are you, like, fully giving yourself over? It kind of a gray area there in my mind. Uh, what I was thinking of, which... every We're at the point where there's so much evidence that every time I think of a cool little, like, theory, I feel like I'm going to throw it out and it's just going to be swatted away, which is fine. But... Gavilar wanted to start, wanted to bring back these, these Parshendi gods, which we know as Spren. Um, and we've had this mention of the Dark Sphere, right? This Dark Sphere, which, let me get it straight, Zeth, did Zeth take it from Gavilar, or did he place it on Gavilar's body? He took the, it, right, as far as I know. The Dark Sphere is on the table when... Eshenai and Gavilar are talking, and Gavilar is saying, I can bring back your gods. And Eshenai sees the Dark Sphere and says, Uh, yeah, you can. And I'm 
that's not absolutely not okay. And so when Gavilar dies, he gives the Dark Sphere to Zeth. He has it on him and gives mm-hmm. it to Zeth. Zeth has it that next interlude we see and stashes it. So Zeth knows where it is. Nobody else does. Okay. So I'm I'm almost at the thought where Gavilar was just successful. Like he he did it. He he brought back these old gods, and that's why we're seeing all of this. Uh, and maybe we'd find that out later, or somehow Zeth did that using this dark sphere. But this dark sphere, in my mind, just has to be the key to bringing back these gods, which are these spread, this evil spread, or whatever. Um, I still don't know what the Dark Sphere is, but I'm I'm just under the assumption that he was. I don't know. So we've seen Gavilar die, and he wanted to bring them back, and then we've seen the desolation has started. We haven't even I don't as far as I remember we haven't tried to connect those, but I'm gonna guess on a more grand scale that. We may find out later that somehow Gavilar was successful. Or this was part of it from the beginning, I guess. I don't know if I'm making much sense with that. Um, you you are. And from the Sons of Honor perspective, they've achieved their goal, right? The desolations happened. The Knights Radiant are returning. And they're going to rule the world again because that's what the Knight Radiant, Knights Radiant do. That's their whole goal. And so from their perspective, it's going great you know like <laughs> and and we do know now that what triggers this to start is the heralds kind of uh giving up or not being able to withhold the the torment in damnation right like right. we we've we learned that not too long ago and i'm wondering if down the line we'd find out more it, we don't really get much info from talonel especially right now um of like it did that dark sphere play into that somehow or somehow, maybe in Zeth's story in Book 5, are we going to see how he had the Dark Sphere and somehow used that or something off off camera at the moment um, to do that? Or if those pieces will connect, of like Talonel leaving and giving up and Gavilar with the Dark Sphere. That would be a very grand scale thing, but that's where my man, mind is. It's a fairly good chicken or the egg question is... Did Dalinar, or sorry, Dalinar, did Talonel <laughs> finally give in and that's what caused the desolation? Or did the Sons of Honor find a way to disrupt that oath pact and that's why, like, what, which one which one came first, you know? Like, did the Sons mm-hmm. of Honor do something or did Talonel finally give up and it just started anyway? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. And I, I think it would be pretty crazy to see it somehow connect down the line um but yeah that that's we've all had a rabbit trail tonight now so <laughs> <laughs> so i don't know if you have any other thoughts on that but uh shalon is going to Alex yes shalon is going on an adventure um that's my other one of my words shalon is going on an adventure <laughs> And for all the people who ask me about our little romance triangle, I think this is going to end up with a lot of development because Ooh. it's Elokar, Kaladin, and Shalon, right? Without the adults Tentrum. watching, right? Like Yasa's not yeah. coming, Dalinar's not coming, and mm-hmm. yeah, just more, more time oh together. God. And also, and also, as of right now, Adolin isn't going, right? Adolin is going. Okay. Oh, ooh, okay. It changes things, but. I think there will still be some, like... We'll see. It's just more time between a small group with Kaladin and Shallan. And my... Still my my standing and my theory, which no one asked about right now, is Shallan and Adolin should stay together. But I think there's going to be... And that's what I hope happens. But I think that adventure ex- expedition whenever it happens is gonna is definitely gonna hint at that drama there that triangle or this could 
really ramp up and we could see some sort of situation where like Shalon has to choose, do I save Adolin or do I save Kaladin? Like, are they going to get into a predicament there? And, you know, they're going to be forced to choose. Does she Did save, this... does she save the wind runner or the fiance? Yeah. That's a good question. Right. Mm. Yeah. That I, I don't know if that's where this is going to go, but I hadn't, I hadn't thought about the maybe awkwardness or drama that could ensue here with Adolin, Shalon and Kaladin all going on a mission together. But she's just running away from Yasna. That's all she's thinking about, right? She, Apparently. She deliberately lies to Pattern. Or she, she lies to herself and says, I'm not running away from Yasna. And then the chapter ends with Pattern humming happily to that. So we know what that means. Which, to be fair to Shalon, is Yasna's really kind of put a stick in the, the spokes of Shalon's wheel. Shalon had things kind of going. She was getting involved in some really big stuff. She was really kind of starting to establish herself as a radiant. And then Yasna comes back and all of a sudden she's demoted back to scribe. And so for Shalon to want to get away and kind of, you know, be involved in the big things and not be forced to take notes, I, I kind of get that. I did notice that Shalon learns a new trick in this chapter. I don't know if this is super important or maybe it'll come into play later, but she she kind of shows us how she's learned how to create an illusion and then attach that illusion to a charge sphere, and then she can leave it. That illusion can feed off of the stormlight in the sphere that she ties it to, and then she can leave, and it still does its thing. That, this is kind of, it, it seems like another, you know, opening up of a lot of possibilities for her abilities and her powers. She's she's learning more and more and more ways that she can do this. Now she can like leave something in one place. She doesn't have to be there anymore. Like the possibilities are becoming endless for what she can do with this whole illumination power. Maybe she's getting spied on and knows it and then leaves a image of herself, you know, just yeah. sitting on her bed reading and then goes off and does whatever. Exactly. That's exactly what I was thinking. It also made I don't think we've seen this. But it made me curious of, like, I guess we haven't really seen another character that can use this. But but it made me think of the, or have we? Like, have we seen someone else who's just, like, like, is, I don't know, is Hoyt a light weaver? Is that oh, why he's always saying. all all these places or things like that, you know? Um, but yeah, I think that's just me being, thinking wildly. Uh, but that's a good point, though. That's something we should remember. We've I've kind of been assuming that Shalon's our only light weaver, but that's not necessarily the case. We're starting to see quite a few radiants pop up, potentially, you know, a few wind runners. Maybe if there's other light weavers out there, we we better remember that they're going to have these similar powers, and maybe things that look like something aren't necessarily what they seem to be. Anything else before we jump back to previous day Dalinar real quick? We can jump back uh, while we're bridging the gap there. Uh, something I just remembered, which I think was just a funny Dalinar moment. Um, throughout this is when he's talking to the Stormfather. I don't remember if it's him talking or in the vision. And he kind of wants to like mold the stone because he sees a what is it a stone ward like do that and he's like it's kind of like oh why can't i do that and <laughs> he's a bondsmith and apparently he could do things with stone but not the same way and the storm father was like no you can't do that or whatever and i just thought it was kind of funny um because Dallin art in my mind it was kind of like a, oh like i wanted to make hand holds in the stone like i don't know stuff like that um, that has no correlation to what we're talking about. That I just I, thought it was funny and it popped into my head. I just remembered. I I remember that too, though. It it does seem like the Stormfather's almost you know treating down like a child. Like, oh, you're not responsible enough for that yet. Well, we'll get there mm -hmm. when you're when you, when you're bigger. 
yeah, I feel like Dalinar has enough on his plate and working through his powers is kind of on the back burner for him. He's like, yeah, I'm a knight's ready. I'll get back to it. You know, I'm trying to work, work, work here. Which I am really excited because we really haven't seen much of Dalinar's powers, and I'm very excited to see them. And I'm assuming, since this is Dalinar's book, that we're going to see them at some point more vividly and, and in practice. So I'm very excited for that. Anyways, chapter 52, uh, more Dalinar flashback. Uh, this is when we first see Renarin in a flashback, right? Renarin is a baby, or is he, is it like Adolin is two and Renarin's a baby, or is it Renarin's two and Adolin's like six or five or something like that? One of those two options, I don't remember. I believe from reading it, it's Adolin's like four or five and Renarin's like one. I think mm. is was the impression I got. You know, Renarin's definitely still a baby, but Adolin's a you know Adolin's talking and running around and playing with swords and that kind of thing. That's right. I do remember that. I did think that this scene here was emotional on multiple levels. Here we have Evie and Adolin Renarin showing up on the battlefield battlefront to see. Dalinar, and we learn that Dalinar has rarely visited them and hasn't even responded to a lot of their messages. It's like he's forgotten about them and neglected them, and he doesn't realize that he's done that, but he's so wrapped up in his warfare and his thrill that he's just kind of let them fall by the wayside, and so all of that is really sad, and when you know, Adolin hardly recognizes his father and Renarin hasn't even met his father before all of that, you know, makes me cringe inside. But at the same time, this scene is actually kind of encouraging. Like Dalinar has a really good interaction with them. It seems like it seems like this could be maybe a bit of an awakening for him that brings him back to, Oh, war and killing and thrill is not all that life's about. There's more than that. And here's your kids to show that to you. But yeah, I'm not really sure where this is going to go, but I was I was feeling some emotions in this one. Lost your cameras again. One sec. Can you know. see me? Yeah, I do. Elliot, Elliot's been frozen on my screen for a little bit. Yeah. Elliot, is, oh, oh. Sure. Elliot is you, frozen, but... Yeah. I still see your picture. <laughs> my And we could hear you died. clearly the whole time, but... Oh, my phone didn't die. If not, it's at least okay on my screen. It just shows you. It shows a nice little picture of you. So, whenever it closes on my screen, I don't still don't know why it does this. Uh, I get green boxes for you guys. Both of you are just green. Uh, like I got an orange box for you whenever you were joining earlier today, like tonight. I was like, you're looking very orange today. Oh, there we go. There we are. Yeah, I can see you well now. Back. back. Good. Okay. I definitely... So this one... Go ahead, Paul. This definitely was an emotional uh, emotional chapter. I, I agree. I, I think the biggest thing I thought about with this chapter, which is something I never thought I would consider, is the similarities between Dalinar and Rock... Uh, it's just two characters that I never really thought about interacting or things like that. But whenever we have this, the the chapter where Rock's family comes back, um, and with his like little ones, like his little kids, um, they weren't cl- quite like warmed up to him, and he just kind of had this like, man, it's been a long time since I've seen my my kids and stuff like that. And also just a similarity between currently Rock is like, I'm a cook, I'm a cook. Um, I don't do any fighting, yada yada. And current Dalinar, which this is not applicable to flashback Dalinar, is less of a, like, fighting person and more of, like, a doing what's right, being loyal, like, rallying a group, things like that. Um, Which is just some similarities, similarities I hadn't thought of before, so... I really like that comparison. I didn't think about that, but that is that is kind of fresh, right? We just saw Rock reunite with his family and like his 
mm-hmm. daughter, I think, doesn't even recognize him or something like that. That's mm-hmm. it's some parallels here to what yeah, Downer's seeing here. That's that's a really interesting comparison. That I had actually true. never thought about it either. Like thought about it that way. <laughs> I'm just really profound in deep thoughts. So yeah, Brilliant. because it, it does it does specify that Renorin doesn't recognize Dalinar, right? He's like he's like a year old and he's very, very young. Uh, but it is kinda kinda sad there, you know. I will say that the I, deliberate different. Well, go ahead, Elliot. Before I say that, I was going to say, and Adolin as well, how he like interacts with his father. He's not too scared of him, but he treats him like a general and not a father. He salutes yeah. him because he's been told, "Oh, my dad's a general. I better salute him." Like just that kind of, you know, oof moment. Yeah. And your comparison there, Paul, that deliberate difference between Rock and Dalinar is Rock has been you know, this whole time, still a family man. He's still thinking of his family. And as soon as he's not a bridgeman anymore, he writes to his family and says, Kim, join me. I now have a job. We can make a living. And Dalinar doesn't even think about his family until they literally knock on his door and say, hey, I'm I'm here. Please, please love me. (laughs) Mm -hmm. That's very true. In kind of the that's why I was comparing Rock's character more to current day Dalinar because flashback like this Dalinar is very consumed by the war and and his work and just everything like that, um, which is very different from from Rock. This could, as you were saying, Elliot, this could be an actual turning point for. For Dalinar, even though he already had one at the beginning of this episode, <laughs> he could maybe have another one where at the beginning of this episode, a- Adolin is born and we have a really cool, tender moment of Dalinar. It's like, man, my life has so much different perspective now. And then he consumes himself with work and the war and like he goes right back to it. But now that he sees the actual consequences of his actions of ignoring his family renarin literally has no idea who he is and maybe that will be a a jarring wake-up call of you know family is super important you need to be there for for your boys yeah it might be i'm a little nervous that it may not be just because we know he's headed towards something terrible and i i don't see him turning for the positive until after that i think i think that's going to be he hits rock bottom and he doesn't make a turn until after he hits rock bottom but we'll see maybe he maybe it'll be even more gut-wrenching and he turns for the positive now only to be crashed back down to the bottom with whatever's going to happen later i'm not sure so you're pretty set that at some point he will hit a bottom. Like he will hit the bottom. He's got to specifically rock's yeah. bottom. He's going to hit rock's yeah. bottom. He's going to yeah. hit rock's bottom. Yeah, that's what I heard. Oh, okay. It's definitely, it's definitely <laughs> canon. Going to move on from that. <laughs> All right. Anything else for this episode? Uh, my only other thing is I, I do agree with Elliot, though, that he is going to hit like a very deep point. Like, where he's faced with no other option than to go up. Um, and that's just because how we see his old personality. It's not something that will just be easily broken or changed. It's going to take something very monumental and, and life shattering right. ha- to happen to him to, to get to where he is now. So yep. like the death of his beloved brother, you know, or wife. Or both. Something like that. Before we close out the episode, I just want to tug that a little bit. What what is Dalinar doing at the death of his before the death of his brother? What what what's how's Dalinar behaving at the He's feast? Partying and drinking, drinking one of the stronger colored wines and stuff like that. Right. I would argue that he's not partying. He's aggressively drinking. He is like mm. he he's not involved in the party. He is drinking. He is at the he is at the bar and he's drinking. 
Mm. And and I think he's remembered that moment like shamefully a couple times. Or he he thinks back to that and he thinks of, you know, oh, I was doing I, I was not in a good place such that I'd let what happened to my brother happen sort of thing, which doesn't sound like party to me. There's yeah, yeah there's a one of his revelations in Words of Radiance is up until that point in Words of Radiance, he'd been carrying the weight of his brother's death with him because he was not coherent that night. And then as soon right. as he fully realizes what Zeth is capable of and who Zeth is, he he then lets down that burden of, you know, even if I had been with him, I would have just died too. You know, like, there's... I'm actually going to let myself go from that responsibility because Zeth is that powerful and I couldn't have done anything. Anything else? I think we touched on a whole lot this week. We did. So I don't have any more. Somehow we still always talk about Gavilar and the Sons of Honor, even if he's like barely in the episode. We just like in the dark sphere. Yeah. yeah. Start start diving through there there again. And even when we only have like one page of notes that should only take us thirty minutes, we we manage to talk for an mm -hmm. hour plus every time. All right. With that, we will conclude this episode and talk next week. Thanks for joining me, Paul and Elliot. See you guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>